join Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu for his presentation of Developing Positive Self-Images and Discipline in Black Children. Dr. Kanjufu presents realistic guidelines and positive developmental concepts for helping black children cope and achieve. Before we look at the workshop on developing positive self-images and discipline in black children, my major position remains the same. I believe the children are actors, and they act out what they see in us. If the teaching 201 cannot get along to teaching 203, we have the exact same problems with children. If parents tell their children, don't do as I do, but do as I say, they have not taught them what's correct. They have taught them to be inconsistent. I repeat, children are actors, and they act out what they see in us. Now, I believe my workshops can be informative, but they cannot change attitude, and I'm very disappointed about that. I work hard with regards to research, but certain things cannot be changed, especially with regards to attitude. What am I getting at? As we begin to look at trying to close the gap or improve black student achievement, my major concern is you cannot teach a child that you do not love. And there are large numbers of children in classrooms where they are not loved. I also believe you cannot teach a child you do not respect. And there are large numbers of black children in classrooms where they are not respected. And then last but not least, I also believe you cannot teach a child you do not culturally understand. In other words, we have integration, or should I be clear, desegregation. But we have many teachers who do not understand the culture of black children. And you cannot teach a child you do not culturally understand. The program is called Closing the Gap, trying to close the gap between black and white student achievement, trying to increase black student achievement. For example, the average white European child on our California test is scoring at the 60 percentile nationwide. The average white European child in America on our California test is scoring at the 60 percentile nationwide. The average black African American child in the same test is scoring at the 30 percentile nationwide. Now what explains this 30 point differential? There are at least five different reasons, and I'm in trouble if you give me more than the five I'm looking for, but there are at least five reasons for this gap. What do you think contributes to this differential between the average white child scoring the 60 percentile on the Iowa and California test and the average black child scoring the 30 percentile on the same test? What are some of the reasons? Okay, and your first name is? Sure, sure. can you get a water break because you answered so quickly. So sure, I think it's number four on my list, and that's the cultural bias of the test. And surely I like to call that the curriculum, not just the test, but the curriculum in terms of their culture biasness. I want to also look at the issue of methodology, learning styles, and I want to look at what you just mentioned, and that's the evaluation design, the test itself. Any other reasons besides the curriculum, methodology, evaluation design? Any others? Yes. Perhaps First name? Gwen. Gwen. Perhaps expectations? From whom? From the teacher. Okay. Very honest group, Gwen. Gwen, that's number five on my list. It's not that I place in this uh, category because of its significance or importance. I simply want to say the best for last. I want to talk about everybody else first, and then we'll begin to talk about you. So Gwen, we'll be getting it to you, to you in a few minutes. Any others? Yes, first name? Richard. Richard. Expectations from the parents. Okay, and Richard, that's number two on my list. Parental involvement and support. I was wondering if this group would blame the one we love to blame the most, and that's the parents. First name? Lois. Lois. I think uh, the child's expectations. And Lois, do you mind if we also connect that to self-esteem for students? Okay, so in this case, we're looking at student self-esteem. Now, there's one more. There's, there's, there's probably a lot more. But the other one that we have to have in order to continue, and that's why we have it in the number one position, it's so easy to, so difficult to identify, and that's the peer group. We are very concerned about the peer group. Now, I'm very proud of this particular group because in most workshops across the country, beside these four, and the one we were also looking for was the peer group, many times people say, well, it's ability. There's at least one or two persons in this audience that believe it's ability. And then every once in a while, we get someone who also looks at the environmental factors, racism, economic deprivation, sexism. And we acknowledge that. There is no way in the world these stats are not also affected by economic deprivation and racism and sexism. We see in our workshop like this, we may, we may not be able to change how Ronald Reagan thinks or David Rockefeller or Casper Weinberger. We may not be able to change what white men make $403 a week and black women make about $234. We may not be able to change that. But we can change the influence of the peer group, parental involvement, student self-esteem, the curriculum, teacher expectations. At least we can make a temp at that. Now, as I said earlier, there's at least one person in this room that may think it's ability. I want to pause and look at this. Because if it's ability, then black colleges, independent black schools, the Effective Schools Project, magnet schools cannot produce a quality product. 
If it was ability, then black colleges that only receive 25% of the students but produce 50% of the graduates cannot produce that kind of product. And if you think they're inferior, those students that go on to graduate training at white universities and receive their degrees, 75% of them receive their undergraduate training in a black undergraduate school. So if it was ability, the same ability the other schools work with, then black colleges, independent black schools, magnet schools, cannot produce a quality product. It is not ability. And since we cannot change environmental factors, let's now look at the other five. Peer group, parental involvement, student self-esteem, the curriculum, and teacher expectations. We apologize for going as fast as we are. We're condensing a six-hour workshop into about an hour. And the first area I want to look at is the issue of the peer group. What we're concerned with here is that we believe that schools are more than academic institutions. They are also social institutions. In other words, very few of us have been trained on monitoring the peer group. And yet this may be one of our greatest competitors or influences on the minds of our children. It has gotten so bad that when black boys want to do a good job in school, they're labeled sissies. It's gotten so bad when black youth want to do a good job in school, they're called, mm, you're trying to act white. And that's deep, deep in two areas. First of all, here we are, the people that built the pyramids, first to read and write. And yet now we're going to attribute academic achievement to another race. That's problem number one. But problem number two, do you know how much pressure is on our youth trying to, on the one hand, please their peer group that has one set of values, and then please you, teachers and parents, with another set of values? A tremendous amount of pressure is on them, and we have to begin to understand that pressure. We were very much concerned about the Jackie Robinson syndrome. In other words, in the class of 30, we'll have our one or two black students in our gifted and talented programs, our honors programs, our AP programs. In other words, the Jackie Robinson syndrome all over again. In other words, we're going to take our one or two top black students and put them in a the class of 30 students. Do you know what it's like being the Jackie Robinson of the class? And your peer group teasing you for being in there? And you have to be the only one or two in that kind of class? There are some other school districts who are trying to close the gap that realize if they want to increase the odds, stabilize black student achievement, one or two is not enough. In other words, some schools are now looking at, let's say, having 10 to 15 students in that kind of setting. So they can reinforce it, not just academically, but also socially. Again, a tremendous amount of pressure being the only one or two in the class. And you know with some insensitive teachers in a setting like this, when they have to discuss a black issue, they ask the black child, well, what do you think about that? Do you know what it's like being the only black child, having to be the authority on all black issues, and you don't want to be black no way, no how? A tremendous amount of pressure. So if we want to increase the odds, we have to increase the number of students in those classes because schools are more than academic institutions. They are also social institutions as well, and we have to begin to look at that. We also believe that competition is healthy. In other words, we are very much concerned that many of our children are shying away from academic competition, and they are very much involved in athletic competition. In other words, we believe that competition is healthy. We believe it sharpens your skills. We believe that there's a psychology of performance. Well, let's be clear, the fear of failure. Many black youth are afraid of competing in academic activities and more confident in athletic activities. And what's sad is many schools allow it, not just in ninth grade, as early as fourth and fifth grade. We have many black youth shying away from academic competition and more involved in athletic competition. As I said earlier, we believe that competition sharpens your skills. And we believe that our youth need to be involved in both of these two particular areas. In other words, in integrated schools, not desegregated, in integrated schools, these principals have told me, if I have a 50-50 black-white school, then I don't want a 100% black basketball team and a 100% and a white science fair team or white debate team. And if it means going an extra step, like the Boston Celtics, to get some white ball players, I'm going to do that. If it means going extra step to get some black students in debate and science fairs, I'm going to do that. Because they are committed to having students involved in both academic and athletic competition. Because it sharpens your skills. And we are concerned about that. In other words, let's move away from the varsity approach to academics, where you only have the top one or two students representing the school. We believe in the intramural approach. We believe in a class of 30 students. Let's say have six teams of five players. Let's have everyone involved in athletics. Let's have everyone involved in academics because competition sharpens the skills. But you know what's sad? Even schools give more glory to their ball players than their scholars. 
In other words, for the basketball winners, they get these big trophies. For the debate team, they get these little certificates. Where are the pep rallies for the honor roll? In other words, we give them to the basketball team, but why not to the academic scholars and achievers as well? In other words, we are illustrating where our priorities are. We want to change that priority. We've got to find ways to infiltrate the peer group, to get them all involved in both academic and athletic competition. Some other ideas on this. The University of Michigan did a study when you and I were growing up, and they wanted to find out what was the major influence on children. The University of Michigan reports in 1950 that the greatest influence on children was the home, followed closely by school, then church, then peer group, then television. Now, Gwen, you probably call these the good old days. Home, school, church, peer group, and television. Hold your brothers, we give you 1980, 1985. Home is still number one, but the streets, the peer group, that's what we're talking about, is now in the number two position. Television and video games are number three, predicting number one sometime this year. School has now dropped down to the fourth position, and I'm sorry you can't find church anywhere on a map. A whole lot has happened in 30 years. I want to again pause and look at the peer group, your greatest source of competition. In other words, the power of the peer group is because they look like each other. You will always emulate those people that look like you. What am I getting at? Connected to the classroom? A, I became a writer to make sure I'm not misquoted. A white teacher can teach a blind child math because expectations transcend race. Don't misquote me. I'm in no way saying that a white teacher cannot teach a blind child because expectations transcend race. But a white teacher cannot teach a blind child how to be black. In other words, in order to be a black engineer, you need to see a black engineer. The power of the peer group, they look like each other. In other words, when I ask black boys across the country to name me five black male entertainers, they don't have a problem. Name five black male athletes, they don't have a problem. But when I ask them to name me five black men with college degrees, they have all kinds of problems. In other words, if we cannot increase black staff at your school, then what I recommend you do, like what St. Louis is doing, is have a central role model program. So we begin to bring in black role models on a regular basis. So we don't want to take the white teacher out of class, but if, she, if he or she has to stay there, then we want every week or at least once a month role models coming in so our youth can see black achievers. And we need to centralize that kind of program. The power of the peer group, they look like each other. Another secret about the peer group. You see, in most classes, let me do it this way, I'll use another sheet. In most classrooms, you have 30 students and you have one teacher. And it's almost 30 against one. That's how it's phrased. 30 against one. You always lose with odds like that. We have got to find ways to get the odds in our favor. In other words, I recommend that a teacher identify who the leaders are. You see, we must get them to buy into our value system. We must find ways to infiltrate the peer group, to inculcate our value system into theirs. And that, first of all, means identifying who the leaders are. Let me give you a secret. The leaders don't walk around saying, with a t-shirt, I'm the leader. I'm running the class. They do it with body language. They do it with eye contact. And so the first step is, do you know how to identify the leader? And then once you do, either before school, after school, or some break, pull him or her over to the side and try to inculcate your value system into theirs. Then they will begin to proselytize the other parts of the peer group. We have got to get more of the peer group buying into our value system. You see, the peer group does not have to be negative. It can also be positive. The question is, which value system they're going to promote? We have to begin to look at those kinds of issues. And so we recommend these kinds of strategies for the peer group. We recommend that, first of all, we begin to put more priorities on our academic achievement over athletic achievement. We also recommend moving, forward and moving away from the varsity approach to the intramural approach. We recommend that you identify who the leaders are, we recommend we bring in more role models to our program, provide pep rallies for academic achievement. But my major concern here is that schools are more than academic institutions. They are also social institutions. It is sad to say this, but you could have been doing your job. Parents could have been doing their job. And it all goes for naught because the black and Hispanic peer group are reinforced what kind of gym shoes they wear, what kind of clothes they wear, how well they fight or dance, and not academic achievement. This is not theoretical. I was in honors classes when I was in high school, and I, I, I was so influenced by my peer group, I flunked the whole marketing period intentionally trying to get kicked out. Had it not been for my father, who then kicked my butt, I'd had some very serious problems realizing his size 11 on my rear end was more important than my peer group. But let me give you a secret. 
when you want to reinforce academic achievement, especially for black boys, it becomes suicidal if he's not also involved in the martial arts. In other words, I was still in honors programs, but I was allowed to run track and also in martial arts because my peer group did not respect my honors achievement, but they did respect my martial arts belt. We have to begin to look at those kinds of areas. Before we move on to the next area with regards to parents, any comments about the peer group? It's tremendous impact on academic achievement. Any comments or questions? You got 30 seconds, so I'm moving on. Yes, sir. First name? Michael. Michael. What can teachers do to, to influence this in the context of a classroom situation? Well, I tried to mention a couple, Michael. One, I wanted you to identify who the leaders were and begin to sell your value system to them. Uh, secondly, I wanted you to bring more role models into your classroom so they can see blacks in, in, in higher professions that have advanced themselves. Two, I mean three, I wanted you to provide, uh, or, or with your school, to provide more academic achievement um, in terms of glorifying that, in terms of pepper alleys and trophies and the like. Any other comments about the peer group? A major source of competition. Another area, parents. We're very concerned about the role of parents with regards to our schools. And one of our concerns, there's a distinction between involvement and support. These two words are not the same but they use synonymously, and we want to begin to look at that. Parental involvement and parental support. Parental involvement is attending a PTA meeting, baking baked goods for a bake sale, selling raffle tickets for a raffle sale. Look, if I never attend your PTA meeting, but I monitor my child's peer group, I monitor television, we go to the library on a regular basis, that's support. Now, I know you want them both, but between the two of them, I sincerely believe support is a lot more significant than parental involvement. But I do agree, after we get the support, we also need the involvement. So I've begun to look at Head Start, to begin to look at Chapter 1, to look at some effective principles in terms of what they do with our students. And I found there are certain things that they do. First of all, we have to find ways to market our programs. I often ask principals, how many parents are going to be there tonight when, I'm, when I speak to them? Well, I don't know. I send out a thousand flyers. That tells me right there, they don't know a thing about black culture. Because the rumor is, if you want to make sure black folks don't find out about it, put it in the book. In other words, we are not a written people, primarily. It's the oral tradition. If you want me there, call me up. So a thousand flyers may only generate ten parents. But a personal invitation, a personal phone call, that's what Head Start does. That's what Chapter 1 does. So they use, first of all, the oral tradition. They find ways to communicate in other ways besides a printed flyer. And then secondly, who determined what the workshop should be about? You see, most schools teach parents the same way they teach children. Well, we decide for them what the workshop should be about. That's a mistake. In other words, if you know that parents are younger these days, are less mature, are changing demographics, then before giving them a workshop on their child's development, why don't you give them one on their own development, on relationships? If you want black men to be there, give them a workshop on a conspiracy to destroy black boys or how to find a job. In other words, one school district in this country, Cleveland Heights, has a 50-50 black-white school population, but a 97% white PTA. They wanted to bring me in to get more parents to come out, but they were concerned with the title. The title says, Developing Positive Self-Images and Discipline in Black Children. If they kept the word black in, the white parents may not show up. But if they don't keep the word black in, the black parents may never attend. They decided to keep the word black in and broke a record that night. And black parents say it was the first time you finally gave me a workshop about me. Now, of course, let me be honest, there were very few white parents. There were only about 43 of them, about 400 black parents. So the next day, I had to meet with the white PTA council. We're still working on how to get both groups together. But we at least solved the objective. We got more black parents to come out. In other words, what I'm really getting at with regards to this is that black parents have told me, Jawans, I know I need to be there. But if all we're going to discuss is last month's minutes, some budgetary changes, and a couple of personnel changes with a boring speaker, I'm simply not going to be there. I gave you a clue, a boring speaker. Remember in the oral tradition, the strength of the black church, a charismatic speaker. If you want black parents to be there, not only have an interesting topic, but also the speaker has to be one that's able to keep their attention. It's unfortunate we have to do this, but we do. And we have to find ways to continue those kind of marketing efforts. And then, of course, there's always those we always can depend on. For example, providing food. It works almost every time. Providing child care, it works the majority of the time. Providing transportation. If your meeting is at night in a low-income, crime-ridden area, you may need to provide security. And then the wonder works every time. Have the children perform. 
In other words, parents, black, white, and Hispanic, and Asian, they all love to see their children perform. You know how many programs I've been on where the choir, not the class choir, the school choir sang before me. And then the principal, oh, and by the way, we're bringing Dr. Juwan's in for a 30-minute parent workshop. And to make sure you stay, and then the choir will then come back with their clothing selections. It works every time. <laughs> we have to find those kinds of ways. And why do we have to do that? We have to do that because before 1954, when we had teachers who lived on the same block, who went to the same church. See, black parents have always trusted the teachers. They've always felt that you were the primary educator. I'm now telling parents, unfortunately, you may not be the primary educator. You may not know what's best for their children. A little later on, we're gonna discuss on the conspiracy to stir black boys, the black children are 17% of all children in this country, but they're 41% of all the special ed children. Now, 17 doesn't equal 41. And it gets worse. If a black child is going to be labeled EMR, LD, BD, 85% of the time, it's going to be a black boy. Now you see, it's called a staffing, where you have this white principal, white psychologist, white social worker, white teacher, or black in skin but not in consciousness, all telling this parent to sign on the dotted line. And because black parents believe in you, they say, well, whatever you think is best. Now, white parents may agree to LD, but they're not agreeing to the award now curriculum of EMR and BD because they realize that they are the primary educators of their children. And so you can't have it both ways. You can't on the one hand say you want them to be the primary educator, and then when they question you, get offended. You know what they told me? I'm not comfortable talking to teachers. In other words, here we are with our BAs, MAs, and PhDs, and use that kind of jargon vocabulary with these parents. In other words, if you're so secure in your degrees, then why don't you communicate with them? I believe, as Jesus said, what you do unto the least of these, you also do unto me. When you are educated, you know how to serve. Many of us are uncomfortable talking with these parents. And so we have to begin to work on those kinds of issues. But some other ideas, because our time is running so tight with regards to parenting. There's a rumor going around that low-income parents cannot produce high-achieving students. Do you believe that? No. There's also a rumor going around that single parents cannot produce high-achieving students. Do you believe that? No. And so we don't believe in either. So my book on images and Reginald Clark's book, Family, Life, and School Achievement, we looked at that. Low income, high income. Single parents, two parents. And what we found out was it was not how much money was in the home. It was not how many parents were there. What it boiled down to was the quality of the interaction. In other words, if you want to produce high achieving students, we identified five common characteristics. First of all, in the high achieving homes, these parents believe that the world is going to be better for their children. You know, in some homes, the parents are already downtrodden, already beaten, and they transmit a dismal attitude to their children. When not in the high achieving homes, these parents say, well, it may not be all what I want to be, but it's going to be better for my children. They first of all transmit hope. Secondly, in the high achieving homes, these parents are consistent with their children. You know, in some homes, mama got one rule on Monday, another rule on Wednesday. Yeah. Not here. There's consistency here. Third, in the high achieving homes, these parents are complementary to their children. You know, in some homes, every other word is four letters. Yeah. Not here. These parents praise their children. Fourth, in the high achieving homes, these parents give their children high expectations. And then last but not least, besides transmitting hope, being consistent, being complimentary, giving high expectations, these parents believe that they are the primary educators of their children. In other words, there have always been two kind of parents in America. There's a teacher-parent conference. You want to talk to the parent. Now, the first kind of parent, not in this study, will probably pass the buck, will probably say, well, I don't know what to do with them either. I got some of my own problems. Can you solve some of mine, too? The first kind of parent will pass the buck, but then you get a second kind of parent who listen to you very carefully. And upon conclusion, we'll say very softly, thank you very much for telling me about my child. Now, if you can just leave us alone for a moment, I can assure you, you won't have that problem anymore in life. Now, you leave the meeting. You don't know what goes on behind closed doors, but it must be like the Godfather, where the parent gave the child an offer the child could not refuse. Or as Bill Cosby told Theo on the first day of the show, I brought you in here, and I'll take you out. Now, these are the kind of parents we like to have more of. In other words, we want to come back and have a detailed workshop with your parents. It's a 16-step parent involvement program. And it first of all starts with establishing goals. You see, I believe if you're going to be a good parent, you have to establish goals for your children. And once you have goals for them, then you can go into stage two, a home program. But you see, you can't even go into stage two if you aren't clear on stage one. In other words, when I ask black, many parents what kind of goals they have for their children, 
I hear things like, well, as long as he don't beat me, as long as he gets a job, as long as he stays out of jail, well, see, if your goals are weak, then your home program will be weak. I have two sons, 15 and 10. I only have three goals for them. First of all, I want them to put God number one in their lives. Secondly, I want them to be committed to the liberation of black people. And then third, I want my sons to be the employer rather than being the employee. Now the question is, if these are the goals to my sons, what kind of game plan, home program, or strategy can I develop that will hopefully, and I said hopefully, that's a key word. You see, I control the process. I don't control the result. It's like this workshop. How I give the workshop, my business. How you use the workshop, your business. There is no way I can ever guarantee any of this for my children. You see, I sleep good every night because I understand what I control. I control the process, not the result. But the question is, if my home program is my process, if I want them to put God first in their lives, should they go to church? Should they read a Bible or a Quran? I mean, maybe. If I want them to believe in God, they need to go to church or read the Bible or the Quran. Hold on, we'll come back to you a little bit later on. Okay. If I want them to be committed to the liberation of blind people, should they begin to read black children's literature? Know that Malcolm's birthday, King's birthday is January 15th, Malcolm's birthday, May 19th, Gary's birthday, August 17th, and Kwan's in December. They should know that. If I want them to be the employer, should I also get some of my own homework? And I just rely on school homework? You know, we have children that know that six times three is 18, but when you give them a word problem, they don't know what to do. If you want to train a child, give the skill first. If you want to educate a child, give the need first. We have people with BAs, MAs, and PhDs out of work. Can't make nothing. They have been trained, not educated. We have to work on that. So these are just some of the kinds of ideas we want to share with you with regards to parenting. That we want them to believe they're the primary educator. And that means you have got to share some of the power. In other words, we can't on the one hand say we want them to be the primary educator. And then when they begin to question us, use our authority over them. In other words, it should be a 50-50 proposition with regards to this child's development. Any comments about parenting, the role it plays with regards to our students' achievement? Yes, is it Gwen? Gwen, right. in terms of uh, helping parents with parenting skills, what do you recommend? You, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, being where the parents are and parents are getting younger. Uh, I'm thinking again in terms of parenting skills where you, let's say that you are in um, an urban setting and you have many young parents and they don't seem to know which end is up. You talk about process. And, and see, that's my point. Mm -hmm. Two things. One, I don't believe that there's, there's not a parent in this country that does not want the best for their child. I, I sincerely believe that. But I also believe that before you deal with child development, you have to deal with self-development. When those parents that are 13, 16, 19, 21, and the like, uh, they have not found themselves yet. And so before giving them a workshop on child development, we have to work with them on their own self-esteem, on their own relationship, on how to find a job. So I, I believe many times we have not asked them what kind of workshops they are interested in. And Head Start is more successful because they ask the parents what they need rather than us deciding for them what they should have, okay? Let me go on because of our time. Let me move to the third area, and that's one of my favorites, and that's the issue of student self-esteem.
ones that built those pyramids. But my new history book, Lessons from History, Celebration in Blackness, for elementary, and there's also one for high school. You see, we are concerned about some issues here. The first one being, where do you start? You see, we have found that many black youth are embarrassed, talking about the history. The Jews, now about the Holocaust, but us, about slavery. I think one reason is where you start. The law says where you start will determine where you end up. Now, where do you want to start our children? If they start in 1619, they start on a plantation. That means they'll probably end up in a ghetto. But if you start four million years ago on a pyramid, they end up being free. Now, where do you want to start? On a plantation or on a pyramid? Because depending upon where you start will determine where they end up. Our first problem is we've been starting in the wrong place. And you cannot discuss four million years in 28 days. Black History Month. Now, I'm glad we got the month. It used to be a week. But you can't discuss four million years in 28 days. It's simply not enough time. And then the other issue, what are we going to discuss? You see, if all we're going to discuss are names and dates and events, then you can do that in about 28 days. When was King born? 29. When did he go to D.C.? 63. When did he get the Nobel Prize? 64. When did he die? 68. That would never change. But if you want to make it relevant, you connect the past with the present and with the future. In other words, what were our mistakes? Because the mistakes you want to avoid and the strengths you want to reinforce. I'll say it clearly. Those that don't know their history, don't know their mistakes, are destined to repeat it over and over and over and over again. Our children need to know their story. And it did not start here. And it should be more than just names and dates and events. But let me calm down and go on. There's still two answers left, Africa and America. But there's a tremendous difference between who you are and where you're born. My hometown, Chicago, the ex-mayor, Daly. If you would ask Daly where he was born, he just said he was born in the USA. But ask Daly who he was. Ask him where his roots are. And he said his roots are in Ireland. Next stop, East Coast, Philadelphia. The ex-mayor there, Rizzo. If you ask Rizzo where he was born, he too would say the USA. But ask Rizzo who he is. Ask him where his roots are. And he says his roots are in Italy. But I think you know what I'm talking about. You and your husband, you and your wife are traveling across the world. And you're pregnant. And you gave birth to a child in Russia. Would your son or daughter be Russian? You're not sure? Next stop, China. And you gave birth to a child in China. Would your son or daughter be Chinese? Hold on. You still not sure? <laughs> Suppose you gave birth to a child in an airplane in the middle of no place. What are you going to call your child then? Delta Airlines or United Airlines? Just because you're born in America doesn't make you an American. If someone asks you where you're born, you're born in America. But if someone asks you who you are, where your roots are, you either say African American or European American or Mexican American, but the who always comes first. Education is more than reading. It should first of all teach you who you are. But you know what else it should teach you? It should make you feel good about yourself. Now the question is, what makes you feel good about yourself? What gives you strong self-esteem? Well, we believe first, your relationship with God. Second, unconditional love from your parents. Third, high expectations from teachers. Fourth, feeling good about your race, color of your skin, and texture of your hair. And lastly, knowing what your talents are. Because of time, I want to look at this one, the issue of race. There's a rumor going around that some of us, hopefully not in this room, are still using terms like good hair. Then that to me is deep. You see, if you know what good hair is, then you must know what bad hair is. If you know what pretty eyes are, you must know what ugly eyes are. That's dialectic, the law of opposites. Our best seller for children is called Colors Around. We believe that our children come in all different colors. But no matter what color they are, they are beautiful just the way they are. Now, what I've noticed, speaking to the primary grade children across the country, they clap for all of them. So the Emily is brown like chocolate cake and very pretty. And Robbie is red like cinnamon rolls and very handsome. The primary grades clap for all the children. But the upper grade laugh at Michael, who's black like licorice candy. And they also laugh at Joseph, who's black like ebony wood. Now, you would think that the older our children are, the greater self-esteem would be. But exactly the opposite. And my question to you, what is it? about America's images, where the longer these children live here, the less they feel about themselves. And remember, Renee is golden like a peach. And the upper grade clap for Renee, and they laugh at Joseph. What well, the reason is very simple. We allow somebody else to define for us what beauty is. If America defines beauty as light skin, long hair, and blue eyes as beautiful, haven't they told you what ugly is? It must be the exact opposite. It must be dark skin, short hair, and broad features. 
Once you know what is, you automatically know what's not. But you know what's amazing? When I was in Florida, I found Europeans trying their best to run down to Florida to get a suntan to look like us. And then I found us running home with noxema and cream trying to look like them. You didn't know that racism is a sign of insecurity? People that are secure are comfortable with differences. Only insecure people. We need to rationalize because they are different. It makes them better. But let me tease you one step further. It's the first day of school. And Renee comes walking to your classroom with her pretty dress on her hair floating in the wind. And like all little boys, Joseph comes in behind her. But on this day, the accident on his way to school did not make it to the executive room in time. Now, do you sincerely believe that Joseph can learn as much as Renee? If you don't, you aren't fit to teach our children. They are teachers who believe that Renee is smarter than Joseph. And when they believe that, she just becomes smarter than Joseph. You know how many black women, even in this room, can't swim, afraid their hair's gonna go back? Go back to where? Where are you afraid of it going back to? <laughs> this is deep. Do you think that what happened in slavery is over? No. Read Peculiar Institution by Kenneth Stamps, the slave making process. We have to work on those kinds of issues. Before we go into our next workshop on curriculum, any comments about student self-esteem, the role it plays in academic achievement? I believe you cannot do a good job in school if you don't like the way you look. Yes? How do you attack the uh, racial self-esteem within the peer group? For example, uh, a boy saying she's good looking for a black skin or a dark skin girl or, or vice mm -hmm. versa. How do you attack that in the peer group? What are some ways of, of looking at it? I think it? we have to confront it head on. In other words, the real damage now is not done between white and black. It's done among the black peer group, black adults as well. And so we have to confront that. We have to show them the beauty and strengths of their color. In other words, we don't have time to discuss this this afternoon, but what are the benefits of dark skin? What are the benefits of your natural hair? See, we hear all about the benefits of being light skin or being white or having European style hair. What are the benefits of dark skin? There are a lot of benefits. Yes? You mentioned um, that schools should have more than just read, write, and rheumatic. Correct. What effects do you feel that this new trend of back to basics, you know, it says only teach math, reading, and writing, uh, will that not eventually have an effect on how we teach black kids because uh, boards of education are trying to get away from uh, uh, Black History and Black History Month and all that stuff? Well, I think that those progressive educators realize that Back to Basics doesn't have to exclude uh, black history, that if the accent is on reading, we don't have a problem with that. We're also in favor of moving to phonetics rather than the sight approach and the word approach. So I, I don't have a problem with Back to Basics. But when you have Back to Basics, just be sensitive about the literature in which you choose. We have to begin to work on those kinds of situations. Because of our time, let me begin to move on. Our next workshop is on curriculum and methodology and learning styles. One of our concerns comes from James Banks, multicultural education. It's the code word now, multicultural. Now, my concern is if it's multicultural, not quote unquote white history, then we will no longer have world history through European eyes. We will put the event in the middle, and we will see what everyone says about the same event. In other words, we'll call this the, uh, the Asians and Africans and the Europeans and the Hispanics and the Native Americans. I also gave you a clue. This is also the order of world population. We are not the minority. There are 700 million of us living in the world. Age is the first and we're second. We're not the minority. 80% of the world's population has color. We are not the minority. But the point I want to make here is if the event goes in the center, not a people, but an event, then we go around the world giving each group an equal amount of time to give their side to the story. That's what will make it multicultural. For example, if the event was Columbus coming to America, Europeans would say Columbus discovered America. But the Native Americans would say Columbus was lost and they discovered him. Same event, but these two groups see it differently. Slavery. Europeans would say slavery was good for America. But Africans would say the black family was almost, not quite, was almost destroyed. World War II. Europeans would say World War II was good for the American economy. But Asians would say they were placed in camps in California. Same event, but these two groups see it differently. If it's multicultural, no group 
is in the center. But when you run the world, then you can do whatever you want. Columbus can discover America. Lincoln can be the one that freed the slaves. You can even make, if you want to, America large in Africa. Africa is 2.5 times the size of the United States. But when you run the world, you can make America large in Africa. You can even move Africa over here and put America in the middle. I challenge it in your school system. Do you have maps showing Africa larger than America? Do you have maps that show Africa in the center of the world? That's exactly where it is, a multicultural education. But beyond content, let's also look at learning styles. The work is from Piaget, from Aza Hillier, from Janice Hale Benson, titled Black Children, Their Roots, Their Culture, Their Learning Style. Remember when you were in school, it's called a split brain theory. The rumor is we're walking around with half a brain, the split brain theory. Remember, when you were in school, the rule, rule was that instructors teach their subjects, but teachers understand how children learn. There are two sides to the brain. There's the right side of the brain, which is holistic. It sees everything. Very good in areas like music and in sports. That's the right side of the brain. But you also have the left side of the brain, very analytical. It breaks things into parts. Very good in math and in science. Now, it has been said in some private academic circles that people of color are better on the right side of the brain, and that people that lack color are better on the left side of the brain. Now, my question to you, did God go to sleep with black folks on the left, but wake up on their right? Did God wake up with Europeans on their left, but go back to sleep on their right? And before you answer, please remember, 86% of the NBA National Basketball Association starters are black, but only 1% of the engineers in this country are black. And isn't it true that all black folks can dance, that we all got rhythm? Is it physical or is it cultural? Come on now. Can't hear you. Cultural. Cultural. Now, I agree with you, Terry, but our children don't. Our children believe, I could probably ask anyone here in Cincinnati in terms of the youth to go one-on-one -on -one with any white boy on a basketball court, they'd have no problems. But we'll be scared stiff in the laboratory. I believe as you do. I believe it's cultural. But our children believe they have a better chance of doing well on the right side of the brain. You see, my concern is that that you do most will be that that you do best. But more importantly, that you are allowed to do. We've always been encouraged to sing and dance and play basketball, but not to become involved in math and science. But remember, there are five ways to communicate an idea in a classroom. And those five are written, which is left brain, oral stories, right brain, pictures, right brain, fine arts, right brain, and artifacts, right brain. There are five ways to communicate an idea in a classroom. Most schools use an exclusive left brain methodology and a left brain test with large numbers of right brain thinking children. A tremendous tragedy. There are two ways to learn left and right side of the brain. Now here's the way the exercises go. If you want a left brain lesson plan, it goes like this. Read the definition. Write the definition. Purely left brain. Read it and write it. If you want to go from left, not to right, but left to whole brain, using both sides, read the definition and then draw what you think you just read. Then you'd have to integrate the left and right side of the brain. You know we have people in this room with BAs, MAs, and PhDs still drawing with stick figures, still drawing like fourth graders. It's not your fault. When you were in school, they belittled the right side of the brain. Let me give you a homework assignment. I want you to develop a right brain lesson plan and then evaluate it with a right brain instrument. We have got to find ways to meet our children where they are. They have a strength that we have not been using. And I wish we could have a lot more time on this major area of learning styles. But because of our time, we're now down to about five or seven minutes. I want to now move into the best for last. I want to now look at teacher expectations. I want to now talk about you. I'm now quoting from the work of Wilbur Brookover and Ron Edmonds. They wanted to find out what was the major reason for academic achievement. I am proudly poor third, not number one, is the student's social economic background. Some of us still keep believing, well, how much money is in the home? How many pants are there? It is not number one. It is third on the list. The second is the school per pupil expenditure. Some of us still keep believing, well, what color is the school bus? How thick is the carpet? 
Well, that is also not number one. How much money is in the school, or in the home, has never been number one. Number one has never changed. Number one remains teacher expectations. Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 1920. One room school shack, 40 students. The roof was leaking. Only two books, and all 40 students learned. Beyond Piaget, beyond Montessori, beyond Glasser, beyond Good Lad, education boils down to one word and one word only. Do you believe that our children can learn? And that seems very simple. The key word is expectations. You know the program. It's called TESA. Teacher expectation, student achievement. The theory is if you increase this, you increase this. But what we found out was teachers are human. Many teachers lower expectations on four factors. Brooke over gives those four as race, income, gender, and appearance. In other words, many teachers lower their expectations based upon the race of the child, the income of the child, the gender of the child, and how the child looks. One teacher wanted to give me another I want to share with you now. She also said, Juwans, I know it's not right, but I also am affected by the parents show up. In other words, I've noticed I respond differently to certain children if I know the parents are involved. I know it's not correct, but I ask exactly what I do. Five major areas that affect expectations. So again, the program is called TESA. It goes into your classroom with a video camera, with your peers, with an administrator, trying to see if they can monitor expectations. And you know the three strands of, of TESA. One is response opportunities. Another one is feedback. And the last one is personal regard. What TESA attempts to do is to see if you can give all 30 children the same number of opportunities. Tessa believes you learn best when you're involved in the process. Now, this is very hard to do. If we were talking about a white teacher with 30 white children, or a blind teacher with 30 blind children, to give all 30 children the same number of opportunities to respond. Tessa believes this is necessary in order to grow and develop. Now, what many teachers say is, well, Juanza, the reason why I don't call on Willie is that Willie don't know the answer. Well, see, the problem is, when you stop calling on Willie back in October, if you wanted to call on now in May, he wouldn't know the answer because he believes you're not going to call on anyone. And then the other one I hear so much of, well, time is so tight. I can't afford to waste time on Willie. Well, see, the problem is, that may be correct in the short term. But when we talk about somebody's life that we're now destroyed, that could be involved in prison later, in the long term, it's better to call on Willie now than have him taking all that money from us in prison later on. We've got to begin to look at having all the children involved. And then the next area, feedback. Two students, Willie, the low achiever, and the high achiever. You call on Willie first, he gets the answer wrong. You probably stay with Willie one second, then you go on to Ann. She also got the answer wrong, but she's your higher achiever. So you stay with Ann a little long, come on Ann, you know it. And they begin to give clue and clue. Five minutes later, Ann finally comes with the answer. In other words, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that Anne feels better about herself because we've given her more feedback, more reinforcement. And then, of course, the last one, the one I'm concerned about the most, and that's personal regard, that's attitude. Tessa believes you should touch the children. Let them know that you care. Let them know that you love them. So what happens, we send teachers to Tessa training, and they come back saying, I touched you, I love you, I like you. But the problem is the children know it's still not there. It's not real. This cannot be taught. You either love them or you don't. In Cincinnati or wherever we are in the country, please don't put all the schools in the same category. Ron Evans, before he died, developed the Effective Schools Project. What makes effective schools? There are three major factors. One, they have strong leadership. In other words, please don't think every school in Cincinnati or in Princeton County School District are in the same category. Because first of all, good principals spend very little time in their office. You see, the good ones are instructional leaders. They're involved in the classroom. They're involved in the corridors. In other words, they realize they should be involved in the educational process. They get there early and stay late. Paperwork done early. They get involved with the students throughout the day. Good principals also have workshops for their teachers, especially in the third and fourth quarter, where you begin to have teacher burnout. You don't need me now in August and September. Oh, but in January and March and April, where well, you have teacher burnout, there's some serious problems there. I know you're not going to like this. I also believe the principals should take their teachers out to lunch, have Teacher of the Month awards. In other words, a good principal is a good coach. They have to find ways to keep their staff motivated. Good schools have strong leadership. Secondly, 
They have teachers, as I said earlier, who give high expectations. What am I getting at? It has been said that in low achieving schools, the most negative room in the school is a teacher cafeteria. Because in that room, you hear comments like this. You can't help these children. These children can't learn. And you know what happens? For the new teacher, just coming in, they get swayed the negative way. But you see, in high achieving school, the principal plants a spy in a teacher cafeteria. They want to know who's making those kind of comments. It's amazing. The good teachers in 201 and 206, you know what they tell me? They don't go to the teacher cafeteria. But the poor ones in 202 and 204, in there all day long. It's amazing how the negative forces do a much better job of organizing than the positive forces. And then the last factor, time on task. There are many schools giving children a lot more time on instruction than other schools. We have to work on these three areas, strong leadership, high expectations, and a lot more time on task. Closing point, there are three kinds of adults in our classrooms. Instructors, teachers, and coaches. We have a lot more instructors than we do teachers. Let me define terms. An instructor means just that. I teach chemistry, teach geometry. I got mine, you get yours, and they mean that. They only deal with their subject matter. They don't deal with learning style. They don't deal with motivation, self-esteem, finding that job description. I got mine, you get yours. Now you know what's sad? With a high dropout rate, we have a lot more instructors in the upper grades than we need to. Need to. Second group, they not only deal with subject matter, but they also deal with learning style. They realize that children have different learning styles. You know what teachers do? They give right brain lesson plans as well. And they use right brain ways to evaluate learning. Not just a test, but hands-on learning activities. And then the last group, they not only deal with subject matter, not only deal with learning style, but they also deal with motivation. They also deal with self-esteem. What am I getting at? You see, a coach understands. Here's how instructors do it. Class, turn to page 10. Now the students probably turn the same level of enthusiasm you said turn to page 10. A coach realizes, I can't teach these children. They first of all don't believe I have something to offer them. So a coach would close the book and begin to ask, what do your adults tell you? You know what I found out? They say two things. One, get a good education. And the second thing you tell me is to work hard. So then we ask the young people, what do you want to say? Well, get a good education for what? And work hard for who? Now these to me are two very good questions. If working hard was the solution, black people should be running the world. Do you know anybody who's worked hard in us? Our children are tired of being the employee. Quit telling them to get a good education, to get a good job. Teach them they can also be employer. But the real issue here, as our time begins to run down, a good education. They watch you with your good education. But many of us work a J-O-B. Now, if all the good education got you was a J-O-B that you don't like, that means you never end up living for T-G-I-F money. Now, if all you have to do is motivate them was with some money, our children are sharp. There are other ways to make this beside a good education, with the four main sources being drugs, sports, music, and crime. You are not going to motivate black youth if all you have to offer them is money. Closing point, the issue is not money. The issue is talent. You didn't know? I'm at work right now. You see, if you have a job, you watch the clock all day long. But if you have a career, then you know where your talents are. And you love what you do so much, you'd be willing to do it for free. But because you do it so well, you get paid for it. The last question. I want all the instructors to raise their hands. I want all the teachers to raise their hands. I want all the coaches to raise their hands. Very good. Thank you very much. Give yourselves a strong round of applause.